I like to call to order the uh, workshop. Well, I'd like to just Thank you. Let's go around with introductions. I'm Rafael Tega, Commissioner of District 5. Jim McDonough, District 6. Uh, Tristan Matt you District 3. Rich Christensen. Karen Francois, do you, do you want to say what, what you do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good step in there. Yeah. Rich Christensen, Chief Information Officer and Acting Director of the Enterprise Project Management Office. Yay. Yay. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, Karen Francois, Deputy County Manager, Information and Public Records. Ryan O'Connor, County Manager. Yay. Tony Carter, Ramsey County Commissioner, District 4. Mary Jo McGuire, County Commissioner, District 2. Nicole Fredon, County Commissioner, District 1. Sheila Denny, Commissioner Dunn's office. Melissa Jamar, Commissioner McGuire's office. Matt Hill, Commissioner Carter's office. Scott Lynn, Subject County Manager, District 2. Fort McKay, Parks and Recreation. The Act of Proceeding Finance. Tara Bach, Information and Public Records Administration. Jereen Rosado, Information and Services. Welcome all. I'll just uh, turn it right over to uh, Karen. Okay. Karen. Very good. Um, today we are here to talk about some of the changes that we have made in the way that we prioritize, the way we fund, and the way we govern technology projects. We've made these changes for a number of reasons. First and foremost, so that we can be even more effective and efficient and strategic at the way we a look at technology needs across the county. We also want to ensure that we uh, continue to align with our mission, vision, and goals, um, with the service team structure, with our new values, with our eight uh, strategic priorities, with a special focus on residents first and uh, racial equity and community engagement. Last year, as a part of information services and the project management office, um, modernization, we surveyed staff. So we also wanted to make sure that these changes um, are responsive to the feedback that we received through that, sur through that modernization survey. Um, and lastly, we made these changes because as we were talking earlier, uh, Commissioner Carter, um, we want to be responsive uh, to the, uh, and keep up with the dynamic pace of change um, that we're experiencing in the county. Um, historically, we've had a technology project request process that was formally known as TAPCAF, which was the Technology Application Program and Technology Application Fund. Uh, that process was facilitated by the old version of what is now known as the Enterprise Project, Manage project Management Office. And, and that process uh, uh, also only, the, the PMO at the time only focused on technology projects, but the new enterprise PMO is focused on both technology and business projects. Also part of that process, the Technology Governance Committee, and we're, we have a slide here in a minute that's gonna show uh, members of our, our TGC, um, and three of them, I think three of them are here in the room with us today. Um, the, the TGC, as part of that process, reviewed uh, the portfolio of requests, and that was done primarily on an annual basis. The process included departments bringing forth uh, technology-enabled initiatives, and um, suffice it to say, the, the process was relatively clunky. Um, I got that word from our CIO, so I'm <laughs> sure it's a te technical term. Um, and some might actually say that it was extremely chunky, clunky, or chunky. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we've actually shifted to a more fluid submission process, uh, a more active governance via the TGC, and a more balanced portfolio of initiatives representing strategic countywide initiatives, service team driven initiatives, as well as departmental specific service offering initiatives. Um, we will be talking about this a little bit more. I'm gonna turn it over to Rich here in just a second. Uh, we will have a, an upcoming technology request for board action 
that will also um, reflect this shift, which actually has been a part of a rebranding. So you will not hear us speak of tap taf going forward. Um, we will speak of it as the uh, information technology portfolio. And with that, I will turn it over to our CIO. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Um, I'll, I'll take us through a set of material, interact as you wish, and then um, we'll talk about some of the implications as we you know, get to the end of the material, if that makes sense. Um, so I'd start with just a recognition of who the Technology Governance Committee is, because this is you know, core of what we'll talk about. TGC will be in the thick of that discussion. And we've, uh, as part of the rebranding and re-energizing of the TGC, we've uh, strengthened the uh, committee members. And we have some here today. We have Mark and Scott is here and Tara. And Dream facilitates the meeting force now, so it has you know more snap to it and more accountability to it. Um, and Kyle Irving in the back there is uh, sitting in as well. Um, well, we, uh, well, I'm in the acting you know, uh, director of EPMO role. Kyle is on that team as a practice lead for project management. And so he's sitting in to help bring the portfolio view of all of our projects into the mix. So um, that give you a, a general flavor uh, for the team, all right? So then if we get to the, to the, uh, to the topic at hand, um, we'll provide some historical context. Some of you have a lot of historical context. Others will be a little more new. And then provide an overview of this revised approach, a little more detailed and, and the high level, and discuss this shift from you know, kind of the annual tap tap towards this new IT portfolio model, and then talk about the implications of that to the funding requests coming forward. Okay? So, for context setting, if you go back, 2005 is when the county you know, kind of came to a recognition that there's this consistent drumbeat of need for technology initiatives and put in place a technology application fund model that started with a $2.8 million um, fund. And you know that went on for a few years, and then the, you know, the dollar request continued to, uh, to increase uh, as technology became more important to the you know, operation of the county. And then in recent years, it's been in the 10, 9, 10, 11, 12 million dollar request range um, for technology uh, on an annual basis. So you can see the growth that's happened over that, uh, over that time frame. Um, and through this all, the Technology Governance Committee has been in place uh, through that time frame. And now, you know, we're revising the charter a bit and, and strengthening a bit, but the, the basic structure was there. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. On that budget point. So while we've grown to almost 10 million, the 2.8 remains the budgeted amount for Ramsey County since 2005. And so that was one of the challenges, actually, is our $2.8 million line and the actual appetite organizationally are significantly out of step. And so we've been having to find other sources, which we'll get into, to fund the difference. And I just by way of reminder, this budget um, takes the first step toward addressing that. We can talk more strategically about it, but goes from 2.8 to 4. To 4.8, it goes up by $2 million um, in 2021. So it, it begins to grow this to try and begin to right size. We'll come back to talk about some. Chip? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm better with all this, but I'm wondering if there's some context here. You know, is there a kind of an industry best practices based on organizational size, budget size, that would kind of guide you on how much you should be investing in technology to keep current and keep your appointment, just for some context. I'm not advocating for yep. more or less, but is there some type of benchmark like that or best practices? There are benchmarks, and um, years ago we went through a benchmarking exercise. The issue is, you know, what do you, what do you count in versus what do others count in? So like in our case, the Emergency Communication Center runs in a separate budget. So if we're comparing ourselves to another county, do they or don't they put that in? Sure. You know, we have some distributed IS, some central. So, you know, getting a, a really solid benchmark is difficult, but there are, you know, there are general ranges of, of where you should be from a, more so from a percent of county revenue model versus a, in a project investment level. And you know, the last time we looked at this, we weren't, uh, we were in a range, but not, you know, didn't just, we're not distinguished at the high end of the range, but just 
somewhere in the middle of that range. Like I said, that's years ago now. We can we can revent we can relook at that. I don't know. I don't know if you need to. It's just helpful. You know, ten million. But I think about you know we got seven hundred fifty million dollar budget, four thousand people, and ten million in the scheme of things seems like a very small amount to keep us where we need. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Judge, just one real quick thing. I, I will come back and talk a little bit about how we ended at the $10 million number. Uh, rest assured, it was a number of hours with the CFO and the CIO and being thoughtful, past history, where are we going, what's the... We did not start with a number in mind. We actually ended at a number that's more specific than where we've kind of been. And maybe one thing to, to put into that that that's part of our governing decision-making now as well is our ability to absorb. So it's one thing to talk about the dollar amount. So a couple of years ago, we actually approved 12 million, but we didn't spend 12 million. We spent 8 million, 9 million, somewhere in there. Um, just you know, the amount of people capacity it takes to take on a major project like you see, employee time and scheduling is one of our active projects underway right now. The amount of effort from people within departments that are working within labor contracts, the new system has to reflect those contracts, and then we have to configure it, it has to be tested, People in the departments are part of that, IS is a part of that, vendors are part of that, right? It's a, it's a fairly major lift for the organization to go through these projects. And so, you know, how much money we approve has to be a little bit right sized to how much we can absorb in project work and then, you know, the actual using of it and getting the full value of the system that we put in. So that, that balances out in that mix. Uh, just to no. Just to follow up on Jim's thinking here, do we have a, <clears throat> given what you just said, for lack of a better word, a needs assessment looking, let's say, in the next 10 years? Because then, so we might allocate 10 million, you use eight. Okay, now we know that 2 million is pushed forward for the next couple of years. Is there any neat, like a neat, I don't know what the appropriate word would be in the IT world. Yeah, so one of the things we're doing in the revised CPC <laughs> is we're uh, framing up some subcommittees, and one of them is an architecture subcommittee, and the idea of the architecture subcommittee is look forward and say, if we're residents first, do we need to have some kind of what's called the industry CRM, customer relationship management tool, it be a resident management tool, but we need some. We, we need to have some of that kind of technology. And if we did, how does it compare to all the case management systems we have in place today across the county, and the unique systems we have for, you know, managing in, like in, uh, in certain areas of health and wellness where we have some uh, case management capabilities and you know, some client management capabilities, right? So painting that picture, then that would that would start to paint a picture for us. What kind of investment do we need to make? over the longer haul and how do we ensure the investments we're making in the meantime are lining up towards a future state, right? So that, that's how we're intending to get at that conversation generally. Thank you. Okay. So I think we have the context here of the type of uh, systems in process today. So we have 20-some you know, million dollars of active project work mm -hmm. underway, right? It's a, it's a major set of in-play work, which is another area we're investing in the government. Okay. So the drivers of change are pretty clear. Um, you know, the process started back in 2005. We were a department-driven organization in the department. The process of tap-tap was to go out to the departments, get a ground-up view of what they need, aggregate all that stuff, build an RBA, and come forward. Well, in the modern world, where we're saying we're residents first, community engagement, racial equity, and we have service teams more, you know, more so than uh, department view of things, we're shifting the model to fit the, you know, fit that, right, as we go forward here to move away from being kind of a ground up to having a more balanced portfolio and just see that as we go along. And then moving away from annual processes, which uh, really don't fit the service team uh, and the strategic team's needs going forward. And then with the size of the active uh, portfolio projects that we currently have in place, like the uh, you know, Next Gen Electronic Health Records, a very large project, multi-year initiative, uh, making sure that we're, you know, governing the things already in place as well as what's coming. All right, so that gives you a flavor um, across the county-wide engagement, community engagement, racial equity, county values, how we bring those things to life 
within the governance structure and, and within these submission structures. Here. Okay. So three areas of change happening together. One's the TGC, Technology Governance itself, where we're uh, more strategic now for the you know, kind of things we've mentioned here. This idea of governing all technology investments. There was a bit of a question, well, I have my own funds. Well, that's interesting. We're still, we're still looking at technology holistically so that we, are, we can secure the enterprise, we can architect a, a more coherent future and all, right? So there's a little bit of change management aspect of that to say, you know, that we're looking across everything. And then this idea of subcommittees, and one of the subcommittees that was put in place was a contract review extension subcommittee where we could look at contracts four years in and then decide if we wanted to re-RFP or extend the contract. So if we just finished fully integrating a system and now it's fully up and running, do we really want to re-RFP that or should we extend it? And then, you know, in the go forward model, we're allowing extensions within the, you know, within the contract space. We don't have to, you know, come back and But anyway, point being, that's been a very effective subcommittee over this last year that's uh, really helped us stay focused on the areas we really need to change. Okay, so those are things going on at TGC. The, what used to be TAP TAP, now Information Technology Portfolio, simplifying the intake process. We're only asking really one question up front. What is the, what is the business need you're trying to solve for? Right, and then we work with those teams. Before, when it was an annual process, everybody had to rush to put together a book of information before they really knew exactly what they needed because we had a one-day review where the TGC sat with everybody and you know kind of looked at every, every project, right? So now, <coughs> we added it in a much more logical fashion. Uh, no wrong door, Karen mentioned that the Enterprise Project Management Office now looks at you know, any kind of change initiative in the county. And so you'll see in Elizabeth's area, we have a number of project managers and organizational change management uh, resources assigned there. Well, if they come across a project eventually that needs technology, you know, they're not gonna go start something different, right? It's no wrong door, whether it comes in through the EPMO, whether you talk to an IS liaison, like, Dream, whether you bring it through a residence first um, sponsorship group, really any way it comes forward will simplify the ability to start that effort, make it easier for the department heads and managers around the county. And then no wrong time just gets at this idea that it can be submitted year round as people have the best information to come forward rather than the annual. All right? And then the Enterprise Project Management Office becoming part of the TGC bringing this portfolio view of here's the 20 some million dollars of active projects, here's the status of those things, here's where we may need to lean in as a group to help push something over the line. Um, and then, you know, the, the Enterprise Project Management Office, right, the, the base idea is bring industry standard things like project management, business analytics, rapid process improvement, organizational change. These are industry things that we don't have to invent. We can take the best of what the industry has, adopt that, adapt it a bit to Ramsey County, and, and bring that to bear. So that's, uh, that's where the EPMO fits in and, and is now part of the TGC. Okay, so we do all those things. Something, some uh, value should come out of that. So um, the benefits we get is this more of a balanced portfolio of what the strategic needs are, getting its share of the $10 million, what the service team needs are, and yet still having room for specific service delivery type project, right? We're not, we still want to celebrate the idea that, you know, Lynn Becker has, you know, a great idea that requires technology specifically for her business area. We just want to round that out with uh, the enterprise level stuff as well. And then moving away from the annual process, uh, it has great value uh, for everybody in the mix. Um, it does change how we work together a bit in that, uh, you know, if you look at the, um, 2019 RBA that came forward, it had enterprise modernization, then it listed specific projects under it. The dollars were at the macro, but it listed individual. And the, the next RBA you'll see, it'll have more of those thematic level, but the projects then will come on an individual basis, governed by the TGC, through the authority you get delegated in the RBA process, right? So there's a little bit of shift, and we'll talk about how that, that you know, manifests if we have the discussion, just wanted to preview it here. And then this idea of uh, really looking at the portfolio of those active projects and making sure that we're resourcing them effectively and getting them to done, right? And make sure we finish what we started. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I, I want to add a couple other benefits that come out of this by kind of criticizing the way the current system has worked and having observed it as maybe the best way to see the benefits. At, on a real high level, part of it is the CIO has often been a facilitator, but not a leader of our technology portfolio development process, which should concern all of us. <laughs> Um, they would often get brought in too late and were basically in a spot to be challenged to have to say no to an idea that had been developing for six months in a department. And that's a really impossible spot for anyone to be in. And the CFO was kind of the only backstop to that then. Um, and it was a weird way it worked, right? And so by allowing projects to come in around the clock during the year with one question, what are you trying to achieve, as opposed to tell me the solution you've already cooked up on the side and pitch it in a book to me, it allows the CIO to come in and say, thank you for suggesting what your outcome is. Now let me help you get to said outcome. And we've already seen that orientation under Rich start, basically without the process being fully underway by saying, everybody stop coming and design solutions. It led to almost having three different ticketing systems across the county for when you get electronic call things that come in. Right? We weren't thinking of how they work for everybody. We're all thinking of we need a tech ticketing solution and this is the person that may have called us or this is the person that we connected with. So I think that's one big area. Another is in the old departmental structure, and I think this one makes a lot of sense to me, if we all sit around the table and we all know we bring in one project, it is our incentive to agree with the other projects because I want my project and if all I gotta do is agree with the other six to get there, then so be it. And so there wasn't really a vetting of projects. It was instead a group that, for all well-intentioned purposes of bringing people together, it led to a spot where everybody agreed with everybody else as a way to get along and get what you knew you needed. And the new structure here moves away from that to a higher level of staff um, at the service team level led by the CIO with the CFO and then a couple department heads that were bringing into the process to begin to be enterprise-wide leaders. But by not putting all of them in, it changes the way in which those decisions um, get made. Final, final point on something that really matters. Oh, and I think in the entire history of the TGC, there was one project that was rejected in the past, if I remember correctly. I mean, which I think you want your batting average to be a little lower than that. Um, I think the, the final piece then that matters is, as we move toward a funding stream that is a better thought out balance around central money available through the budget, alongside you do want some money to come potentially from the year end savings to compete with other capital needs, but be more thoughtful about how we're doing that. When we have been 75% coming from year end needs, departments have all the leverage because they say, I'm bringing money to the table that I've been saving all year to make the project go. And it again creates this idea of it's mine, it's not ours. And that's just the wrong way to go about it. And so part of the changing the funding mix is it changes the way in which you come to the table. I'm not even asking to have the discussion about mine versus yours, it's ours to begin with from the outset. And these are just some of the things that were deeply involved in the development. And you know, Rich, from where he sits now, has gotten to where it's starting to move. I just want to pause on that and reflect on what we've learned since 2005. I have Tony. Thank you. Then, so, uh, Tony Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Got everybody. <laughs> so I really appreciate seeing the configuration that includes this real hands-on kind of information technology portfolio opportunity, no wrong door, any time of the year, you know, tell us what you need. The enterprise project management, creating <coughs> strategy organizationally, and then being governed by the technology governments, governance committee. It feels like, you know, a real symbiotic way of managing the work. Additionally, it does move us from a place where we're getting the need for technology and here's the best idea and the application how it works to fit my individual need um, to a place where we are encompassing. Yeah. <laughs> we, just, we felt like it wasn't right. exciting enough here, so we want some wow, club music. Wow, I love it. You know what? I, yeah, we could all get up and dance. The chair asked so, for it. <laughs> so, uh, as I was saying, no, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying, it takes us from that place where we're getting those individual ideas to the place where we have these organizational strategies. But that introduces a need also for some different, more forward education process. You know, as we want everybody to adapt, and most often we adapt what is our idea, you know, best. So if our ideas can begin to be shaped in this 
organization-wide strategy um, environment, then that brings us all to a point where we're coming to technology. You know, we're not seeking it out, but we're coming to it. Is there a thought about how that education process works so that we have people who are in the departments or representing the departments and service teams coming to technology? Do you get my point? I, I think I do, and I would say um, nascent, right? We're, we're starting down that path. But Doreen is taking the message that we've been providing at the higher level and taking it down to the next level in the organization so that we have you know, kind of a manager level around the county <laughs> understanding these shifts and, and what it means to them. Um, so we have that level. And then the TGC members you know, are chartered to bring back into their organizations kind of a service team message to say, hey, let's look at this thing more holistically. Okay. So there's pieces, but I would yeah. say we could we can take an action to do more. Uh, I just appreciate your hearing that. Um, I really appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's nice. laughs> Thank you. Dirty, maybe it's... <laughs> well, <laughs> these are on you, too. People know. Is that a technology problem? <laughs> I mean, do technology. I'm up, up on the table. And <laughs> is, it, is it on the table? Yeah, one of these they're saying needs to get tabbed out. Oh. Whatever oh, one is projecting the official one, this is projecting this one right here. Okay, Karen. Take the music off your. <laughs> I was thinking it could be me. That is my kind of music. <laughs> oh, it's a board meeting. Uh, oh. Thanks, Matt. Oh. Yeah, hey, joining your team now. Yeah. <laughs> Look at All you. Right, no, Matt. I don't know. Those millennials, you know? I know what to do with the song. Just, just be one. one. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, right. are you done, Tony? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mary Jo. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and I don't know when to ask this question, but let me tell you, when you mentioned CRM, or Constituent Management Tool, I was elated, as was Melissa, because for eight years we've been asking for something like this, and I'm hoping this is what I'm going to, I'm asking my question to hope that this is what it is, because when we, when we first got here and I came from the legislature, she came from Congress, we said, how do we log in when constituents call us? How do we follow that? How do we know where that is? And then county manager, lovely as we loved her, she said, well, send it to me. And we said, oh, okay, great. That doesn't feel like a very great system. But um, so we've been really asking for some constituent management tool. So I'm really excited if this is what that really is. So that when we, you know, we get calls from constituents. And so, um, again, to know, and, and I, I get that there's going to be data privacy and all this stuff, but clearly the legislature knows how to do this, Congress knows how to do it. Certainly counties should know how to manage that information. So I'm, I'm hoping that this is what that is. Can you help me and, and, and affirm my excitement that we would have some tool like this to use? I'll say yes. Okay. And I'll just, you know, by explanation a little bit. Yeah. If you think of a constituent management tool or a resident management, it's, mm -hmm. it starts from the resident mm -hmm. and then they may have a series of interactions with us. Yes. Case management starts from a situation yeah. and then has a mm -hmm. person associated with it, right? So the constituent management really part of this whole CRM idea mm -hmm. is that you're starting from the person and working out into all the interactions, right? So, so yes, that, that same idea uh, from the constituent is how you look at it would fit what a CRM is. And, and once again, I'll just point to Dream coming from uh, San Diego, where they implemented a, a CRM in the public sector. She has, you know, she has a framework yeah. for yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how to think of something like this. Yeah. And, and so I just encourage you. I know you've got a team going, but you know, talk to some of us and talk to our assistants. I mean, Melissa would be excited to be a a, a, a test case, you know, to talk about the kinds of things that we would love to to have see in a in a CRM and the kinds of work that that comes through our offices. Anyway, so yeah. I hope you're you're going to be talking to us and our assistants uh, because we're dealing with a lot of this. So thank thank you for that. And then um, another question, uh, and maybe I take this offline. So is the is the library going to be included in all this, or is that just one of those issues that we're still working on? But that that their whole library system is to be included in all of this too. I know that that's an ongoing. 
Yes, from a governance point of view, and I think I talked to Joanna about this, uh, from a governance point of view, the library is included. And there's kind of multiple aspects of the library, yeah. right? We are in IT consolidation for core things in the library that are common with the rest of the county. And then there are unique things in the library like 3D printers, okay. right? Which is uh, kind of a, a niche type of a project, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, governing versus owning and um, budgeting for, right? There's, you know, there's still some nuance in that, but yes. This this year, this budget that you just approved yes. fully consolidates the library's technology functions into Ramsey County. Okay. Otherwise, that money's coming back for something else. Yeah. And we have a different conversation to be had. And I mean, I'll just share our words out loud. I mean, the recent launch of the website was not fully integrated across the organization, yeah, and it was kind of news to um, some of us. And yeah. that was a thing that I both want to say, like, it's a nice launch and it looks very nice, but that is concerning when we talk about residence first service delivery and we talk about using our libraries differently. <laughs> and I can assure you that conversation's happening. It's why I want to raise it out loud is to make sure you're all aware that that's part of what we're continuing to go through. And I appreciate that and I'm a part of those conversations, so I'm glad to hear that and we will all be a part of those too. So thank you, thank you for that. Jim and then Nicole. Oh, Krista then Nicole. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just kind of in the vein of saying things out loud, I was going to pass, but I, I do want to, you know, I really appreciate you kind of your comments there because, you know, from my perspective looking at this, this is all really good stuff and really happy about it, right? But laying out, uh, you know, the old way of, you know, six transactions and we're done here and we're good to go, a lot of people benefited from that, right? So there is some change management that needs to be called along here because we, there are people that benefit from the old system. They designed their solution. They made yeah. the deals. They said yes to all the other projects, whether they mm -hmm. mattered or not, because mm -hmm. they got their interest. And I'm just hoping that, you know, eyes wide open, we're continuing this change management as we're doing this, because I kind of fell into this trap. This is great stuff. Well, I can, I'm sure there's people out there that are saying, I don't, I like the old way a lot better, mm -hmm. because I got what I needed, yeah, I and I didn't need to do all this, right? And so I just, I, I want to say that out loud about this change management here. So we're bringing the organization along and we're not having active resistors, mm -hmm. you know, slow us down or mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to, uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. I just wanted to ask, like, in the decision-making process, in this new process of projects that are being proposed, is there some kind of rubric that rises things to the top in the way of, Priorities. You know, I've heard from other departments like the recycling and energy that for years and years they've been asking to be able to receive credit card payments from their haulers. They still can't do it and they've been told to wait in line. But now haulers are saying, look, we don't even have a checking account anymore because the way of the online banking is. And so it's in the way of thousands of dollars that are being held up. So I just am wondering do we have a rubric of like urgent need? Because We've done a great job at doing things on a shoestring budget. I think our technology budget probably needs to go up, so I'm excited to hear what those numbers are. But in order to do cu good customer service, we have to get you know, online. So what's that rubric for priority and timeline? Well, Madam Chair, Commissioner, on the first one, the environmental health thing, then they need to talk to finance because we have an entire group that involves them in the okay. implementation of credit cards across the organization, of which they're a core governing team member. And they shouldn't be just whining about that on the side, quite frankly. They need to bring that in. I mean, we PCA <laughs> compliance has been a big deal. We had departments though, that rushed to do it and didn't comply, which opens us up to huge liability with new federal standards sure. that came into compliance. But I'll take that one back on the side because okay. that shouldn't be something that we're held up by. And I'll let you answer one about rubric because we do have some stuff. Yeah, so in the new Refresh Technology Governance Committee, we have a prioritization <laughs> model Right, with some weighting and all, and it you know weights the strategic initiatives at a, at a kind of a entry level. If you're, if you're solving for one of strategic initiatives, that's a bar. Or if you're solving for operational effectiveness, or something like this would be. So if we're not purely on the strategic side, we have the ability to get at the the operational effectiveness as well. And once you get into there, then we look at um, the aspects of how enterprise wide is it versus niche, and you know does it. Uh, do we have the capacity to do the work and absorb it? And then we get down into the values and the engagement, racial equity, and then risk mitigation. You know, so if we're doing something that's residents first and mitigates a risk, right, that's a nice combo. So we, we have a, a kind of a scoring model there. I don't want to over in, over, overstate that because we don't want to be over-engineered on, you know, it's not purely a math model, but we do at least uh, force ourselves through that. 
and we're in very rich dialogue right now about you know, about that process. You know, we had we spent a, a fair amount of time in our last meeting about uh, race equity, and we were talking about a project that was already 70 percent of the way through, and we're requesting additional funds. Okay, well, how do we community engagement race equity? How do and where do we fit in that? How do we make sure it comes to life? And what we're doing, and yet in a way that keeps things moving, and how does that fit in our prioritization? So, so we have a model that we're learning our way into. And so, tying the, the community engagement piece together with um, something Jim said about change management and this shift for letting you know, technology experts manage the technology needs to meet the business needs, but what role does um, business and user validation and uh, engagement play in the process so that we're not designing a system that users aren't able to, to actually use? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so in response, you know, we use a industry project methodology, right, you know, or a program methodology that's a big multi-project that residents first, but for a straight project, if you take a, you know, an example, we would start the project with the ideation, right? And if we decide we're gonna fund the discovery phase, this is one of the other things changing, instead of asking a project right away to say, I need 1.4 million, when they've done almost you know, a thumbnail's worth of work, say, wait, let's do a discovery phase first. So we authorize a discovery phase, that's when someone like Kyle or someone of his team comes into the mix and we have a project manager then or a business analyst work with the business people and say, what? What business need are we solving for? What are those core requirements? Do we have something already that might do this, right? We have a case, it's case management, but we already have some case management tools, would one of them work? Go through all that process, and then if, once it becomes a full-fledged project, then we do requirements gathering, fit gap analysis to say where are the gaps in the solution we chose <coughs> that we need? Do we change our process to fit the tool rather than molding the tool? So we have a, a full standard, industry standard type model for engagement that you know, starts with the end user. And, and Rich, one other piece. So while the pendulum is moving here, I mean, we've been at the side of operational units drive tech decisions. I mean, that's pr pretty much been where we've been at. And it doesn't actually lead to better user end outcomes, I think is the important thing to know, because they lose the sight of how the technology on the back end works. And so we build tools that are well-intentioned, but sometimes have not been well thought out and you end up spending extra money to re-architect them. So electronic health records, you'll see on the screen in a minute in terms of like size of project, largest project we've done. When the three business units started out at a departmental level thing, what we did is almost built three separate electronic health record systems because each one said, well, I need a special drop down box on the first entry <coughs> page for my thing without actually saying, is that better for the person who may, you know, and so that's the part, we're trying to find that balance that actually brings the enterprise wide look in but doesn't lose what you just said. Thank you. Good. All right. So just the key takeaways, <coughs> trying to make the process more nimble, be more reflective of the county's strategic focus, efficiency and <coughs> effectiveness has to be in the thick of it, the, the level of investment we're making here. Um, those, are, those are things we're making shifts to, to reflect, okay? All right, so then we get to <coughs> kind of what the outcome of this is. If you look here, uh, significant allocation designated residents first. I think that's a key thing. You know, we say a hey, $10 million type of uh, investment, you know, $2.8 million minimum towards residents first was, was kind of the thumbnail that we put in, right? So that we're, we're ensuring that uh, you know, the, the biggest key strategy that's technology rich type of a strategy gets its share of investment. Um, and then the request for board action <coughs> will come forward in early March. And it'll ask for a dollar amount. We'll go through the details of that, and then it'll um, you know, give a specific guidelines as to what authority you guys delegate, which is 95 percent the same as the previous years, just do slight tweaks at that level. And then we'll govern uh, based on the prioritization from there. Okay. So with that, I'll get right to the dollars. And I want to start with with Lee not here. He said one thing you want to start with right now is uh, make the comment right away. We're not asking for new funds in this meeting. Right? <laughs> like this is, you know, in 2019, we planned for 2020, and in the year end of 2019, the you know, uh, service team allocations to go towards this, the 2.8 that's always there. Right? This is an, a reallocation of funds 
along with the 2.8 that's uh, already planned for 2020. So this is not new, different money that we're looking for. With the quarterly budget, um, uh, on that allocation based on the quarterly budget reports that Lee mentioned during his comments and said we should have started these years earlier. So in quarter two, we started looking at projections for the year and started to say, how much do we want to balance what may be year-end savings that would otherwise accrue to individual capital projects at a departmental level or just fall to the general fund bottom line? We looked at the health of those and we began, by the end of Q3, we had a target number here where we went back and agreed with all service teams. Their target number actually said, you're gonna help fund the technology at the end of the year as a part of this now. And so that's actually what happens when we talk about last week's budget resolution where one service team wasn't able to participate the way the others were. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens, but that's how we got to this number. So it started in Q2 with the controllers, went to Q3 and then got to that. Tony? So I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. The 2.8 million, which was the original TAP allocation ends up being the number that's allocated to residents first. Any reason for that, or is it just going to spin off? Um, and the second question is regarding the monthly reports. Is that a monthly report on technology contracts only? And then also that would be repeated in the quarterly report on contracts. Yeah, so as I understand it, Dana is here. Dana Napi uh, described to me a monthly capital report that you received that includes the technology, all but I don't contracts. think it's all contracts, though. Okay. So all it's right. part of Got it. it. Thank you. So On the first part about the residence first, so <coughs> this was this was intentional. So it is a direct, the residence first aligned the 2.8. Going forward right now, the residence first portion of the technology fund, where we're trying to prioritize residence first service delivery putting aside other organizational needs. There's a lot of reasons for technology. We're trying to balance many of them, right? Things are falling apart, we need to do this. But if we argue that, we will always, think something's always falling apart somewhere. That is starting at 2.8. In 2021, the TAP allocation goes up to 4.8. And so 48% of the total ITP funding portfolio by next year will be dedicated towards a residence first prioritization, that's half. We don't know that that's necessarily the right number. We need to learn next year and then decide. And the next budget that comes out, the biennial budget, will be a conversation with this board about is 4.8 the right number to allocate in that, is 48% the right number or is 70% the right? I don't have an answer for you yet. I just want to let you know we're watching that and now we have a path to learn along the way. Okay, okay so any questions on the uh, breakout of the dollars? So the discussion steps, you know, alignment uh, around, you know, kind of the direction we're heading here and the changes we're making, and then we will uh, submit the official ITP request for board action, um, and that will have the $10 million, and it will, you know, kind of show residents first, strategic initiatives, effective and efficient kind of major blocks, but not specific individual projects, and then delegation of authority to the TGC level through the company manager for us to, you know, when we get a CRM type project comes forward, then we'll allocate discovery funds to that and start that project. And, you know, we just went through an enterprise asset management initiative in the last technology governance meeting um, where there's a request for additional funding to, uh, you know, to finish the, the fleet asset management. And so dollars, then TGC would allocate those dollars into the Enterprise Asset Management Initiative, um, you know, as these projects come along. Just, uh, just, yeah. you, just spurred a question when you said it's um, like a, a CRM would come forward. Who would bring that forward? Because there's an arguably a number of different departments. So, and then I think I go to Commissioner Mendes Castillo's question, you know, what's the rubric or what's the queue? How, 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 which gets, which happens first? But um, who would bring like a constituent management system forward? Yeah, um, in this case, the CRM is a, an example, is yeah. a residence first yeah. initiative at its core. And so you know, our plan is to work with the residence first teams. This is not coming from right. yeah. you know, a, a single department, right? There's, there's bubbling up of it in different areas. And then there's you know, the strategic part of the TGC now saying, hey, we think this is an area that we should be moving forward. So, you know, we're going to we're coming to residents first, saying, "Hey, you know, we want to start down this path. Seems like a residents first initiative. Do we have you know, synergy there? If yes, then we'll take it into the governance and say, you know, where does it fit priority wise, and when when would we start it? Um, 
you know, like anything, it may be the best idea, but there may be a prereq or two that you know have to go before, and so that's part of our you know of our discussion. And we say when would we bring this you know into a discovery mode or into full implementation mode? Because you know, in order to do one of this, you know, maybe a little deeper than what we want to go, think about uh, customer relationship management or resident relationship management. Right, and we're going to have a resident there, and we're going to provide them a multiple of services, and so therefore we have staff that then have to provide those services. Well, today our identity and access management infrastructure isn't strong. So if I change departments, how well does my, you know, role-based um, access move with me? Kinda, right, and so. Getting those kind of basics in place so that when you put me out in front of a resident and I'm working with them, I have access to the right systems and data with the right client, the right resident at the right time. And not things I shouldn't have and not short of things that would really make me resident mm -hmm. first, right? So you might say, hey, CRM is our number one thing, or you might say CRM is the value we're going to get, but identity and access management has to get to phase two before we do that, right? So that's that's the Hard part of the work. Ryan, then Nicole. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Blair, two things. One, that's why we're putting money towards residents first yeah. stuff first. Okay. It's going to come up. However, I want to move us away from CRM. I do not think that yeah. is enough, and I think yeah. that's actually a pretty light touch to what we're talking right. about. It's the I, idea that when we talk about service delivery for Ramsey County residents, this is not currently part of our facilities plan. Yeah. And before we build a bunch of places, or I come and ask you for a lot of money on ways to help improve service delivery, I think we need to pause and say, but Almost everybody now, almost everybody has access to a phone, and we have yet to have a portal in to where we can do some of our work. It doesn't mean we can do everything, it doesn't mean it's magical, but what I, what I found when I was the health and wellness deputy was that this process didn't necessarily incentivize me coming forward with this when I had to deliver on some of the other technology stuff because it was all operational, the Commissioner Fredlin's earlier discussion back and forth, right? And what we need to do is reorient towards the idea that if it's always about the needs of the departments, right. that will always serve just those needs. And I'm not even diminishing those needs, they're important. But um, this idea of moving towards the residents first money is trying to reorient who we serve first. And that is where the change management actually is quite hard, by the way, because it's gonna crowd out things at different moments. And we've already faced some of these big points where people are saying, yeah, but like this is a really big deal to me internally and here's why. And I, it's like, I don't dispute that, but it's a big deal that we can't use this right now to start your application online before having to wait in line down at the East Building. And uh, we're going to have to make those tough choices. I'm going to have to continue to ask for your help to help reinforce that as we go. And just, if I could just, and, and I appreciate that, and really I like the way that you described it. It's really about when you go to a constituent, you when you go to a resident, you actually know what they've all talked to you about. Like, it would be nice if you knew, oh yeah, I, ca I called my county commissioner, a year ago and, and told them about this and they referred me here. I mean, I, I just want them to have, I want the data to be um, complete. So whatever that is called, maybe it's not a CRM, I don't know what it is, but I like the residents first, I do. Okay. Yeah, I, I would also like a better way to manage constituents. <laughs> yeah, and that's good. I, I don't know that CRM would, would do that, yeah, that, or that certainly would be the priority in it, I guess. To the to the idea of applications, like what role are we playing in, in talking to state departments, which are giving us uh, technology that we use? Because it would be great for someone to fill out their application on the phone, but until uh, we have state systems that would allow us to do that, to actually transfer that data, so you're not like manually re-entering what they wrote on their phone into that system. I don't know how helpful that would be, but I mean, some of those systems are also set up for you know, the benefit of the system and the people that are working for it. So you look at an application for assistance and it's set up to, to flow with the system and not what a family would logically think to provide to you. And so it seems even bigger. So is there any work with those agencies to try to work together to improve those systems? So I'll, I'll say yes in the broad sense. So we're part of the Minnesota County IT Leaders Association. So a group of us county IT directors and CIOs meet regularly, and we have a uh, person on staff that we all pay for collectively that collects these types of things. And we, and we talk to the state and they say, you know, thematically, SISS, or SSIS system, we think needs to you know have these features next that allow us to 
get at data more easily or to analyze data better. And, you know, Maxis needs to make these kind of changes. So we have a, you know, a little bit of a, a collective voice um, into that, uh, tempered with, you know, these, a lot of these systems are still in mainframe based applications from a long time ago with a lot of feature richness in them. And the state is not, you know, retiring those at a rapid pace, right? So, um, you know, this is going to take, it's going to take a while before, you know, those are modernized. <coughs> <coughs> no. <laughs> I know. Any I'll, I'll just wrap a little bit, Mr. Chair. Uh, final comments on all right. I mean, this is a, this is both, it feels like a technical process, but it's a pretty big deal in terms of the size of the investment coming forward and the need to continue to get tighter on that. We've seen failures at the state, quite frankly, that leave us with concern and reflection on our own about how to avoid finding ourselves in the same spot here. And I believe unless we move to a, a stronger governance model where the CIO has more oversight over that authority with a direct line to the county manager so I may work with all of you, I do get concerned that we get too far down the road on something that just is not a workable technology. We've had a couple of close calls and we have not had that happen. And I'm proud of the fact that leaders have stepped up and not allowed it to. But um, hopefully this both provides, you see that this provides the flexibility, but also the approach. And on, on your earlier question, Commissioner McDonough, just to end on this, when we sat down, we did not start with a number in mind. What we actually said was, we know that 2.8 is far too small. What's the funding mix we want to see? And um, and what feels right? And actually, we came back to 10 through Rich first, being the one that really talked about that. Lee did talk about what would be able to be fit in without significant organizational changes. If we went to 15, we would have to really do some things differently. But what we saw was 12 million right now is more than we've proven we can handle. And eight million is too small to be enough. And 10 million is more than where we've been year to year. And hopefully by getting better through this process, we can spend the money we're allocating um, and figure out from there where we go going forward because it is a balance alongside other needs that we need to balance. Jim? All good stuff. Um, a really good conversation, I think, too, here. Mm -hmm. And the RBA coming forward, I appreciate, you know, we'll have the monthly contract, but what, what's the plan for keeping the board in the loop about success, the clunkiness and lumpiness, the lessons learned, um, you know, how we're managing. I really want to get a good up feel, no matter what we're doing here, how we're managing changing the organization. Because for success here, we've got to get good at that, no matter where we're at. So, you know, what's the built-in piece here about coming back to the board? At what point in time does it make sense? How do we keep it? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner McDonough, I think there are two ways to answer it. One, uh, I think Rich, in hearing that, if there's a need to schedule specific workshops on the topic as we roll out of the gate, that's a conversation that I think we should just continue to evaluate as we go here about what can we bring back from meaningful discussion. But the quarterly service team meetings that start in April, I don't know if your first one's April or May. Ours is April. Okay. Yeah. They start in April. Um, this is one of those topics that would be a regular standing update piece as we talk about where the progress is at on, on projects. And I was going to echo something similar to that, but I want to add the roadmap for the dollar piece. Okay. I think we need to get at least a sense of what we're talking for the next five years or something. What is it that we're going to need rather than sort of year by year, it might be 8 million, it might be 10. And if we're under, then I sure. come up with, I don't want to be directive, but mm -hmm. maybe that stays in that project, in that trajectory, you know, because mm -hmm. next year we might need 2 million or 4 million more. So uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. I, in not wanting to get out in front of the board and their budgetary decisions, what I, what, what I would commit, though, if it's good here, is to help signal some of that in the request for board action that comes forward and acknowledge it's not binding, but here's where our thoughts as an organization lie. Um, part of what it'll show is 48% of the funding's towards residents first out of 10 million for next year. We have the plan here for this year. Beyond that, though, my hope, Right now is in the next budget, we bump the number of 48%, closer to about 75% of the money comes from a clearly dedicated funding source, beginning in the 2022-2023 budget. Signaling that alongside the idea that some of the money we absolutely still think, or at least right now I would pitch to you, you should think about it is a good 
thing to lay these projects alongside other capital things coming from departments to make them put their money where their mouth is. And so as we grow, we actually want sometimes departments to throw in some matching money to that. And I think what we can do is in that request for board action, lay out a little bit of this for you um, without saying that we actually know until we get in the next budget. I just want to clarify on the budget piece specifically, I, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but just want to say it out loud is that that includes the whole project management for any of these IT investments, right? So the staff, yeah. because we, you know, if we go to some kind of base, there's a ton of policy prep work before we ever buy the widget. And so I just want to make sure that includes all that funding in the whole process. Right? Correct. Okay. It used to sort of not though, right. but now it does. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that out loud. because. I know, thank you for saying that, right, so is that there's a lot of prep work before we get a tool for, you know, there's just that policy and planning is going to explode before we move to something like that. So. Tony? Tony. Thank you. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that this is really the same question that we've talked around for some reason. I was looking at page 10 and looking at sources of funds as a good way to outline uses of funds as well, you know. What are those things that are residents first? What are those things that are um, organizational, operational? What are those uh, strategies that come to align with service team needs and then departmental needs? So I look at this sources and I think about categories for usage too as we come back and we report. So annually we know the direction or the strategies that we're employing in each of these areas. What kind of residents first changes? What kind of organizational operational? What kind of service team specific? What kind of department specific? So just as an addition to that direction for reporting, that could be very helpful for us. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Ortega, uh, the only piece I'll say to that too, yes, we'll, we'll do that more on the program level than, I don't want to tie, this might be technical, but I don't want to tie to the allocation spot too much. And the reason I say that is, because the service team appropriation line, just by nature of the way our organization works, most of that money comes from one service team because of the size of it and how it creates. And so we are having to get out of the mindset and credit to uh, Dr. Allwood and his team for being a part of this, but it become, this is Ramsey County's money, this is not health and wellness's money. Now, they should have a large seat at that table because a lot of the operational stuff needs to change there. But until this year, it's been like, well, I'm bringing this to the table, so this what do I it. get for it? Yeah. And I want to give him credit. I mean, sure. it wasn't like we, um, that, that's not an easy spot to be in. And I know that you have some important projects on the table, but it took leadership out of that team to really change. So, so I, I don't want to make it about allocation. Mm -hmm. I want to make it about the work, the program. Yeah. Yes. And, and that whatever. really is what I meant. Oh, good. Although okay. the categories still Got seem it. to reflect well. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Allwood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any further discussion? I think we're all good. Moving on, are we getting good work? There's still, he's still got three slides up. No. no. Oh, you no. Okay. 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 oh, you don't, oh, we already went through I'm just following in your alignment and next step, you're not producing, okay? okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked about them all. We okay. Did. I, I want to make sure you were done. I'm, we're done. But thank you. Make sure you were Mary Jo says we're done. With I that. know. I can't remember. <laughs> I say we're done. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> all right. You know. Yeah.